Have you ever not gotten your way when it comes down to uh, to, to something that, that you wanted? And when you didn't get your way, what you did was you pouted about it. Now, you might not want to admit to that being you, but you know somebody who has. And all of us have probably been in that situation uh, ourselves as well. But uh, what we did is we started pouting because we didn't get our way. Well, today we're going to look at the pouting prophet out of the book of Jonah chapter 4 as we continue and and do our final set uh, on our study of the book of Jonah. Grab that Bible, turn it to Jonah chapter 4, and we'll see you in just a minute. Hey folks, welcome to the Wednesday Bible Study of Central Baptist Church of Oak Ridge, North Carolina. Again, we're so glad that uh, you're joining us this evening. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn on over to the book of Jonah, chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, the the final chapter uh, in our study of uh, the book of Jonah, uh, and we titled this one, The Pouting Prophet. Now, one of the things about it is, is as we look through uh, the the Word of God, and we saw, we've been watching what's been taking place with Jonah, I want to kind of give you the end of what was uh, what was taking place as we start to head in uh, to chapter four. But as we finished up chapter three uh, last week, it was really, really interesting uh, what we read. This is actually chapter three, verse 10. Uh, it says, and then God saw their works, and he was talking about how uh, the fact that Nineveh had repented. Verse t- Chapter three, verse 10 says, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said that he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Okay, that's how chapter 3 ends. Today we're going to pick it up uh, in chapter 4, so uh, if you have your Bible, just continue to read along with me. Uh, Jonah chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, uh, was was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Verse 3, Now therefore, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better uh, for me to die than to live." Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it uh, in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him uh, from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, uh, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, uh, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished for uh, wished to death for himself and said, "It is better for me to die than to live." Verse 8, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity uh, on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which more than uh, than one hundred and and, and twenty thousand uh, people who cannot discern between uh, their right hand and their left hand and much livestock. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, we come to you now. We thank you. We praise you for this opportunity to once again gather around your word. We pray, Father, that you would help us to truly seek what the Spirit would have to say to each and every one of us on a personal level today. Uh, Lord, may we not find ourselves in the same uh, position uh, that we see Jonah in, uh, in in this particular case. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you will speak to our hearts. Use me, your servant, for these few moments that you truly would be high and lifted up, and we'll praise you for it as we ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, as, as we've been you know, looking at, at these particular passages uh, in the book of Jonah, been following what's been taking place and what's going on, one of the things we have to understand is that we don't really know anything about Jonah's past. That was b- before God called him. We don't see anything in the Word of God that tells us or even mentions him before God called him uh, to go down to Nineveh. Yet we know nothing about him after the completion of this particular mission uh, except for the, the, the brief narrative that we're given here uh, in Jonah chapter 4. So what we find is that, that Jonah did not get his way. That's really, really uh, what it boiled down to. You know, so let, let's think about what was taking place with, with Jonah for a few minutes. Now, if you've been with us and you've been following the story, or maybe you know it from you know a lifetime of, of being in church or, or, or hearing messages, uh, just to kind of give it to you real uh, brief in an outline form, God called Jonah. He called him to go down to Nineveh to preach repentance to Nineveh. Jonah didn't do that. Jonah went down, got on a ship, going to Tarshish. Uh, God said, nope, it's not going to work that way. Uh, the storm came up and, and the ship was tossed to and fro. Everybody thought they were going to die. Jonah knew it was his fault. They even cast lots, and the lots fell on on the fact that it was Jonah's fault. Uh, So essentially, even though the sailors didn't want to, they threw Jonah overboard. It says The word says that as they did, the sea calmed out, and I thought, well, that's a pretty good decision. And then this great fish comes up, swallows Jonah. Jonah's in the belly of the great fish for, you know, three days. He gets spit out, you know, on the shore, and it says that that he's started to head to Nineveh. This was the second chance that we talked about. So he's heading to Nineveh. It says uh, in our chapters previously that that was a three-day journey and uh, Jonah made it in a day. Um, you know, still don't really know what his mindset was, uh, but all along we've sat back and said, well, why was it that Jonah was so disobedient? Why was it that he didn't just want to follow what it was that, that God said? And we get the answer to that over here uh, in chapter 4. So I wanted to carry you back over to chapter 4 at the very beginning of it, particularly verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, um, you know, now remember, as we finished out chapter 3, it says that Jonah did go into Nineveh. He did preach repentance to them, and the whole town repented. Man, you and I you would be sitting back going, that's great. We would probably be high-fiving and doing everything that we could to celebrate with them. Not Jonah. He's not doing that. You know, in fact... God spared the city according to verse 10 of chapter 3. And then here we get into into chapter 4 where it says this. It starts off in chapter 4 verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Now, if if you're sitting there you know, thinking, man, I mentioned this last week. You know, if I went somewhere and had an opportunity to preach a revival, and not only did everybody that attended the revival repent, but the whole town repented, man, that would be marks for you know the the beginning of a great great revival. But yet, you know, Jonah was the instrument in God's hand to you know to to bring that about, and yet he's angry. Notice again, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. He was mad because God had spared the people of Nineveh. And most of us might be scratching our heads and sitting back going, well, why, man? I mean, that you, you would think that of all things, this would be a, a place where he would be just exceedingly happy. Here's the big problem. Jonah had a lack of love for the people of Nineveh. He could not stand Nineveh. You know, we went sitting there looking from the very beginning of our study of Jonah, wondering why it was uh, that he rebelled. Well, look with me at chapter 4 and verse 2. Jonah, we know Jonah's displeased. Verse 2 goes on and says, So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Now, I want you to pay careful attention to that. This is that I told you so thing. You know, that right here is when it finally starts to come out. Now, let me read it to you again, and then I'll explain it. It says, you know, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents 
from doing harm. Now the truth comes out. Jonah basically said, I knew you were going to do this, God. I knew this was going to happen. I knew that if I was obedient to come down here and to preach, I knew that these people were going to repent. And, and the thing about it is, you know, I, I knew that you were going to spare the city if that took place. Well, you might think, well, why are you so angry then, Jonah? And here's the bottom line. Jonah did not like the Ninevites because they were not Jews. Now, you talk about uh, racism at its finest. There it is. In fact, as we read through this, not only was this the way Jonah's heart felt, yet Jonah said, I would rather die. That was what he was basically saying. I would rather die than see this happen. I mean, yeah, we use this expression in, in our day and age that says, you know, is that really a hill worth dying on? For Jonah, it was. The repentance of Nineveh was not something that he wanted to see. Remember what we said when we began this study. God wanted to not only reach a, 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 a tank, or reach a city, he also needed to, to, to show one of his servants uh, who he really was and teach him some lessons along the way. You know, how easy it is, is it for us to fall into things uh, like uh, sectarianism or you know, color, ace, uh, race, age, any of those uh, sort of things? You know, why do we feel like we have the right to say, well, I'm not going to minister to those people over there because they're not like me. They're different than I am. And I just flat out don't like them. Well, like I said, you know, when we look at this, what was the reason? Jonah didn't know every single person in Nineveh, but he stereotyped them all the same. They are not Jews, and therefore I don't like them. You know, how easy it is to fall into those type things, particularly in this day and age. Now, I want to remind you of something from the biblical standpoint. Romans 3.23 says, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means all, and that's all that all means. That means you and me, every one of us have sinned. We have no right to stand and to be judged, particularly when it comes down to things like color, race, age, those, those sort of things. Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross for every living, breathing human being uh, within the sound of my voice and not within the sound of my voice, just anywhere, anytime. So Jonah didn't know all these people, but he already had something against them. Okay, yeah. The the cross is what demonstrates God's love for all people. I've I've used this expression for years and years and years. It's not one that's original to me, but it is one that is that that's very hard hitting. And that statement is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Yeah, nobody is any better than anybody else. We are all uh, sinners saved by grace. If you've, if you've trusted him, you know, otherwise you're just a plain old sinner. But there's no one that's better than anybody else. The, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And every person needs to be uh, saved and every person can be saved. So God loved the, the people of Nineveh. He didn't want to see them perish. He didn't want to have to bring judgment upon them. So he picks out Jonah, a guy that cannot stand the Ninevites, to go down there and to preach to them. Yeah, and, and, and then when he goes in and he preaches, I can imagine what it must have been like. Jonah is seeing the, the, the whole town repent. And instead of being joy, you know, joyous and rejoicing, he gets mad. And, and, and notice in chapter 4 what he says. He says, God, I knew you were going to do this. That's the reason I didn't want to come down here and preach. Because I knew that if I did, you were going to take that, you were going to use it with your people, and these Ninevites were going to repent. You know, short of saying, I wanted to see you destroy them. I wanted to see you just throttle them. I wanted to see them wiped off of the face of the planet. But the problem is I knew you weren't going to do that because you're a kind uh, long-suffering God who loves his people. And this makes Jonah angry that God has done that. Now, now think about you know, th that position of, of being in it, that, that sort of hatred you know, for a people. And then being able and then looking God in the face and saying, you know what, I'd rather die than, than have this happen. Yeah, I wanted to see you kill these people. Now, I've had conversations with folks before, you know, in, in my 30 years of pastoral ministry and, and counseling, and they've been mad at somebody. And, and what they really want is they want a pound of flesh. And they come to me and they want me to go get a pound of flesh from you know, their brother or sister. And, and you can hear it coming out in their voice the same way that you can hear that from Jonah. 
Now, I knew you were going to do this, God, and I didn't want to see you do that. He didn't come out and say that. But, but every action that he has said that he wanted God to destroy the Ninevites and completely wipe Nineveh off the map. Now, when I've sat down with people and been in that counseling session, they won't say that to me. They won't say, I want a pound of flesh. But what I try to do is I'll try to say, well, let me ask you this. What does uh, justification or what does reconciliation with this party look like to you? Not one time in over 30 years has somebody said what they're thinking. What are they thinking? They're thinking, I want a pound of flesh. But you see, the problem is they won't voice it because if they voice it, if they say it, it becomes real. If they say it, they have to hear it. And, and if they say it, then they don't want anybody else to think that they want uh, you know, vindication from that person and they want you to do it. Not one time in 30 plus years when I say, what does that look like to you? What, what does vindication look like to you? What does justification look like to you? What does reconciliation look like <clears throat> when it comes to your situation with that other person? Not one has ever said, well, I want you to draw and quarter them. I want you to hang them by the neck until dead, dead, dead. No, they won't say that, but that's what their heart is saying based on their actions. That is exactly what was taking place right here with Jonah. Jonah was mad at God because God had saved the people of Nineveh and not destroyed them. Now, you can see that. You don't have to be a theologian to see what's going on, but sometimes we're blinded by that in our own lives. Why is it that we have such a hard time in being able to see that. You know, well, one of the things that was that was a part of Jonah's problem was that that Jonah loved pleasure. Now, a lot of y'all are sitting back going, well, I don't see that. I don't read that in there. If you go down in verse 5 of chapter 4, and we begin to see it, it says, so, so Jonah went out of the city, and he, and he sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see <clears throat> what would become of the city. He is still thinking that God might uh, choose to destroy them. He don't even want to be with the people. He goes outside of the city. He's like, I don't want to even be around these people, but I'm going to sit back and watch what happens because they only had 40 days, remember? And, and he's thinking, well, maybe along the way in 40 days, maybe they'll backslide. Maybe they'll turn away from God again because that's happened very quickly as we've seen in the Old Testament with, with uh, certain groups of people. And he thought, well, maybe I'll just hang out here and see. Maybe God will still uh, go ahead and just destroy this city and, and, and maybe he'll take pity on me and my feelings and, and do what I want to do. So he goes outside of the city and, and he builds uh, essentially what's called a booth or a place on the east side of the city. He's waiting for God's judgment to fall on, on Nineveh. Even though he has seen the whole town repent, he is still holding out hope that God is going to wipe them off of the face of the planet. You know, you know he's wondering, wondering why God's judgment does, doesn't fall. Well, what's going on? Okay, he knows why God's judgment's not going to fall, but it, don't, don't we continue to push a bad situation um, even when we're wrong and even when we know we're wrong? Wrong, sometimes we'll still <clears throat> continue to push that bad position or bad narrative. But think about God's grace <clears throat> that keeps you and I from his judgment. You see, we tend to forget about that. When we're in the middle of wanting God's vindication on somebody else, we always forget God's grace that has been extended to us. You know, how many times has, has the Lord said to us, I, I, and I love passages that come out of the New Testament, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, where he says, judge not lest ye be judged. Uh, and, and essentially what he says is, if, if you use a standard of judgment against your brother, that's, that's an extreme standard. God said, if it's good enough for you to use, then how about if I use that standard of judgment against you? Yeah, you know, grace, God's grace is great as long as we're receiving it. But we don't want God's grace on those that we consider to be an enemy or different than us or unlike us. You know, we want God's judgment on other people and we want God's grace on ourselves. But think about it for a minute. How, how has God's grace 
been extended to you that has kept you from judgment. You know, I, I've said this before. I said when it comes down to things like that, God has, has forgiven me of much, and therefore he expects me to forgive much. You know, we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. So when you think about not wanting to forgive somebody, when you think about <clears throat> being in a situation that, that churns up hatred, God says you know, this. He says, would you want me to treat you in the same fashion that you are treating other people? And obviously the answer to that question, if we're honest, is no. That is not what we want. Yeah, think about it for a moment. Think about God's grace that keeps you and I from his judgment, okay? The Lord is not going to let Jonah get away with this attitude. Man, Jonah had a terrible, terrible attitude, and his attitude moved into actions. But the Lord's not going to let Jonah get away with that. You see, he get, then he teaches him a story through an illustration because uh, the, the word in chapter 4 tells us that, that overnight this gourd grew up. And it was going to provide, uh, and it provided some shade uh, for Jonah. Jonah's sitting there going, oh, this is nice. You know, I, I don't have to be out here in this beating sun and wind up with heat stroke. Man, that is so cool. I can just kind of get up under this, uh, this gourd uh, plant for, for shade. But then it says that as the morning came up, you know, it said God, it was, by the way, remember this, God is the one who caused the gourd to grow up overnight. God is also the one who caused by morning the worm uh, to come up to eat that gourd and for the gourd to die. And then not only did, did God uh, allow that or create that scenario to happen, it says that he created a vehement, that, that, that's your adjective there, a vehement east wind blowing on Jonah's head. Maybe he was bald. I don't know. But it was the heat was so bad blowing on Jonah. And Jonah said, you know what? I would rather die. I want to die. I would rather die than see God save these people. Uh, look at the situation I'm in. Oh, poor, poor, pitiful me. You know, why am I in this circumstance? Why am I in this situation? It would just be better that I were to be dead. You see, for Jonah, comfort was more important than God. God saving a city. I've got to be comfortable. Why am I in the heat? Why am I this person? All the while, while he's pouting because of what God is already showing him that he is doing in regard to saving the people of Nineveh. And, and unfortunately, there are many in this day and age and in this society that are just like him. We are powders. <clears throat> We're all about ourselves. Which, by the way, verse 9 goes down and talks about how Jonah was really all about himself. Look with me, if you would, down to verse 9. It says, Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, and this is how Jonah answered him. Jonah said, It is right for me to be angry even unto death. Yeah, how many times have you been in a situation where uh, somebody says to you, do you think you really uh, have the right to do that? And, and knowing good and well that you don't, and you sit back and say, yes, I have the right. Yes, I have the right to be angry. That's exactly what God Almighty said to Jonah. He says, he says you know, uh, look at it again, verse 9. <clears throat> God, this is what God is saying to Jonah. Is it right? He's asking him a question. <clears throat> Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah's answer is, you're darn right it is. No, that's not the way it says it in the New King James. But in verse 9, he says, it is right for me to be angry. Not only is it right for me to be angry, it is right that I am angry even unto death. How easy is it, is it for us to fall into the trap of love of self? See, self-pity is, is, is what we consider to be one of the respectable sins. That's the way we look at it. And by the way, did you understand how that ended? Sin, well, sin is sin. But we look at that as, as a respectable sin. See, you know, one of, uh, uh, self or the love of self uh, is one of the sins that brings us to two things, despair and depression. When you are all about you, that can bring you to despair and depression. And I, I can't tell you how many times over the years that when somebody is battling uh, you know, disparity in their life or depression in their life, and it really has been all about them, you know, and you know it, 
Uh, and and, and they, they're really having a hard time seeing that. We've talked about well, what can you do to serve somebody else? How can you be involved in somebody else's life and take the focus off of you and put it on to somebody else? It has been astronomical, the things that God has done uh, when somebody says, Lord, I want to go serve somebody else. I, I, I want to be an instrument in your hands. I want to take my focus off of my problems, my issues. I want to take my program, uh, take my focus off of me, myself, and I and put it onto somebody else. It's been drastic changes in their lives when I've seen those things happen. You know, uh, too many people want to justify the sin of anger, just like Joe Jonah did. Jonah said, I do well uh, to be, I do well to be angry. No, he didn't do well to be angry. Nobody has the right to be angry. It just doesn't work that way. You know, God is not giving us the right to be angry. All right? So don't think that, that you like it. Jonah believed this. Jonah said this to God. Yes, I have a right to be angry. <laughs> you know how absurd that sounds? Think about it for a minute. You know, God is pleading with this pouting prophet, you know, to, to have a heart like him, to see through his eyes. Think about the lessons that he learned from the gourd. Yeah, you know, God goes on and tells him, He said, You know what? He said, You cared more about a gourd, about a plant that you had absolutely nothing to do with. You didn't plant it, you didn't fertilize it, you didn't, you know, you didn't water it, you didn't cause it to grow. Uh, and, and, and the thing about it is, he said it came up in one night and then God created the worm. The worm ate the gourd away. He said, you didn't have anything to do with that, but yet you cared more about that, that plant that you had nothing to do with than the people of Nineveh who God loves and, and God wants to save. You see the compare and contrast there? Yeah. Hopefully at this at this at that particular point, Jonah had an eye-opening experience. We don't know. We don't we don't know what happened afterwards, but we do know that I, I will make you one promise. God got his message across to his pouting prophet. Okay? Yeah, the chapter ends with God still pleading for Jonah. Listen, man, you know, think about my people. Think about those that are dying. Think about those that are going to hell. And they need to hear. And you're not justified in saying, well, I'm just going to be able to go over and minister to these people. I, you know, Lord, I hope these die over here. I mean, that sounds bad when it comes out of your mouth, but that's exactly what it was that Jonah was saying. Do you hear God pleading with you? Let me ask you this question. Do you care about people? And if you sit back and say, well, yeah, I care about people. Do you care about all people, even the ones that don't look like you? Even the ones that don't worship like you, you know, even the ones that may be from different countries, do you care whether or not they die and go to hell? And if you sat back and said yes, then let me ask this question. You know, what priority does, does serving and ministering to them have in your life? What has priority in your life? Serving the Lord or serving yourself? What has priority in your life? The things that you want to do or the things of God? Is that making sense? Is, is the Holy Spirit, you know, convicting your heart in that regard? You know, does, uh, who rules? Do you rule yourself or does the Savior rule you? Very important question. Because when you allow the Savior to rule you, then He can use you. You, you can be an instrument in the hand of the Father. Now, you also have to understand that that doesn't always mean He's going to send you where you want to go. There are going to be times that you're going to have to go into some uncomfortable situations. But I've often found, too, that those are the times when God does the greatest things. I still remember back uh, many years ago, it was probably 20 years ago, that uh, was, I was doing some, some mission work with the North Carolina Baptist men uh, down on the, the, the coast of North Carolina. We were actually in the region that's called Old Dock, a little town called Old Dock. We got down there and we didn't get to work on the project that we were planning on working on. Uh, so they pulled us, because it wasn't ready, so they pulled us to put us on another project, and it was a construction project. And it was a couple that was in their 80s that were still living in a house that had been flooded, you know, the, that had been mucked out, mudded out. Uh, the, the floor was gone, the back of the house was gone, and they were actually living in this place. So we worked there for that weekend, and I can still remember this 80-year-old man who was the homeowner, who came up to me and he said, uh, he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, 
why are you doing this? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, why would you come from you know, another, another region of North Carolina and come here and sleep on a cold concrete gymnasium floor and come over here to help me and not charge me anything? I don't understand why you're doing this. And I said, well, you know what? I'm glad you asked that question. I said, because God loved you enough that he called me as well as these other uh, men that are part of this construction group to come here and help you because he knew you needed some help. And, and, and he said, God, God loved you. God's the one who called us to do that. And we're just serving him. You know, the, the cold concrete floor doesn't matter to us. We want to be instruments in his hand uh, to be used in your life. Well, <clears throat> as the day went on, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with him. His wife was a believer. Uh, in fact, the night their house got flooded uh, was a Wednesday evening, and they had prayer meeting, and, and she actually got into a little rowboat, and, and he actually rowed her up to the church that was also flooded because the church was having prayer meeting. I thought about that. Church is being flooded, their houses are being flooded, and they still went to prayer meeting. And i tell you one thing, if it looks cloudy, we won't even go out the door to head to a worship service. But this man was unsaved. He had seen the witness of his wife for 50 years, more than 50 years, and had never trusted Christ. How do I know that? She shared that with us. And uh, before we left, we got a chance to lead that man to the Lord. Because I asked him, I said, you know, I said, the reason why we're here is because the Lord called us and he loved you that much. Shared the plan of salvation and I said, would you like to trust him? And he said, yes, I would. And I still remember the joy. Our team got together and we joined hands uh, in in that house, in the, the part of the house that we completed constructing in two days. And as he asked Jesus to come into his life, when he said amen, you would have thought we were in a stadium. Not only was our crew there, but there were crews from two and three houses down that were working uh, that, that came over and watched this man accept Jesus. And they, they encouraged him and they surrounded him with love. And what a joy that was. The really cool part is that I'll know. Uh, you know, I, I didn't ex- particularly care to be sleeping on a cold uh, concrete floor, but I didn't allow that uh, to keep me from being what God wanted me to be uh, and being used as an instrument in His hands to bring somebody to the Lord. His wife was so happy. She said, I prayed for you for decades, and now we will spend eternity uh, together in heaven with our Lord. And what a joy uh, What a joy that is. I don't know that that man is still here. I believe he's probably with the Father uh, now, either that or he's over 100 years old. Either of those could be true. But I'll tell you what I do know. I'm going to see him again, and one day we're going to get a chance to, to glorify God together. What a joy that will be. Will you be an obedient servant? Are you serving Serving the Lord, or are you serving you? In just a moment, we're going to pray and ask God uh, to, to use us, you know, that we might be instruments in His hands no matter where He might lead us. Because He might lead you into some places that you don't particularly want to go. Um, that's tough on us at times. You know, we, we don't always like that. So uh, let me tell you this here's what our readings are going to be <clears throat> for uh, this coming week. Uh, I want you to study. Exodus chapter 5. All right, we're actually going to begin a new series next week uh, through the book of Exodus. And next week, we're going to discuss um, Pharaoh, a man in rebellion from the book of Exodus chapter 5. And then we're going to kind of progress uh, on through uh, some uh, some passages uh, relative to the Exodus for the, the next X number of weeks, however long it takes us to get through that. But we're actually going to be going and looking at that. So this week, I want you to pay careful attention to and be in study and meditate on Exodus chapter 5 as next week we look at Pharaoh, uh, a man in rebellion. Uh, so look, uh, let's look to the Lord in word of prayer. Let's ask God to give us a great week together. Let's ask uh, Him to help open our eyes to where He wants us to be able to to serve Him and and where we can be used most effectively, even if it's someplace we don't want to go. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the fact that you still use uh, men and women to accomplish your will. Um, Lord, I pray that as we have taken this time to to look at how silly 
Jonah's attitude was. And look at how silly his heart was. Well, we realize that this was a man who was so deeply rooted in his hate for the Ninevites that he would rather die than be an instrument in your hands uh, to see repentance come about. Lord, I thank you for the victories. Lord, And I pray that we will celebrate the success and the victories as people come to know you. What a joy that truly is. But Lord, help us to make ourselves available uh, in every area, in every realm that you want to use us. Help us, Father, this week as we uh, endeavor a look at your word uh, in Exodus chapter 5. May we not find ourselves in the same shoes as Pharaoh found himself in in the passages that we're going to be looking at. Lord, I pray that you'll give us courage and that um, above all, we would be more about you than we would about ourselves as we continue on in our life. Lord, give us a great week. Lead us to some Somebody who needs to hear an encouraging word or a word about you. And, uh, and then, Lord, give us the grace and the strength to be able to share you with those in our sphere of influence. And, Lord, we just pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hey, folks, once again, we want to thank you uh, for joining us for the Wednesday Bible study of Central Baptist Church, Oak Ridge, North Carolina. If you don't have a church home, please come and visit with us. Our services are at 1045 uh, a.m. on Sunday mornings. Um, uh, we're looking to do some uh, uh, launching some small groups uh, here in the very, very near future. We would love for you to be a part of that as well. Come on down and see us, 1715 Highway 68 North. If you're familiar with our area, we're right across Highway 68 from the Oak Ridge Military Academy. If you need more information, as always, you can find us on the web at www.oakridgecbc.org. And uh, that way you can get all the information you need. God bless you. I pray you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you Sunday.